Hello, and welcome to another session of data mining. Last time we talked about what is data mining and what is machine learning. And in this session, we are going to discuss different applications of machine learning. And we are going to discuss a framework of different machine learning applications. The objective of this lecture is to enable you to identify machine learning problems around you. I feel that that is an important aspect of being a data scientist. It's one thing to be able to run different type of algorithms, uh, such as neural networks or uh, nearest neighbor or support vector machines, but at the same time, it's equally important to be able to identify a different type of machine learning problems around you. So where can machine learning be applied? Where can data science be applied? So in this lecture, we are going to do that. And as I posted on the slide here as well, an ability that I would like you to learn is to identify how to use machine learning in different domains. So machine learning can be applied or data science can be applied in a variety of different real world applications. And today we're going to talk about some specific examples. Before moving on to those specific examples, though, I would like to emphasize something that's quite peculiar about humans. And that is, we are the only species in the known biological universe that can store more data outside their bodies than inside their bodies. So data and information is something that makes us unique. So if you think about it, our bodies are composed of trillions of cells and each cell has DNA in it. And that is a way of storing information. It's genetic information that is uh, that identifies an individual and acts as a template for that individual to do their different biological functions. And it is a transfer from one individual to another individual as well. Uh, so you can think of it, it's a different perspective. It's a, probably a non-biological perspective of how you look at DNA, but it's also a form of data, data storage. So the amount of data that you have in a single cell in terms of the form of its DNA is about the same size as would fit on an old style CD. So it's about 700 something megabytes. The string, the DNA string within each of our cells is about 3 billion characters long. It's composed of these four letters, A, T, G, and T, and we can compress that and represent that as data in binary form. And that is where this number comes from. But regardless of that, we are also able to store information in our minds. We are able to form memories and we are able to form thoughts. And that is another way we store data. However, storing data in the form of DNA, other biological species, even trees are able to do that. <clears throat> Whereas if you think about thoughts, and if you think about memories, those are something for at a higher level of cognition. However, what's, what's peculiar is that about humans is that we are able to store data outside of our bodies as well. We can write. So writing is a form of data transfer as well. And we can, we can store huge amounts of data, more than what we can hold in our heads. We can write it out. We can store data in the form of USB disks, or we can have uh, solid state devices. The amount of data that we store outside of our bodies is huge. Think of it as a non-biological augmentation of us being humans, the, our ability to store, store data. So it would be right if we say that the current age that we are going through is an age of big data. Okay, so the amount of data that we have uh, currently, if, so if the digital universe were represented by a memory stick, uh, memory in a stack of tables in 2013, we would, it would stretch two thirds to the way to the moon. By 2020, there would be 6.6 .6 stacks from the Earth to the moon. So the amount of data that we are creating, that we are storing, is increasing at an ever increasing rate. So there's going to be a large amount of data that we're going to have. <clears throat> and, and one way, one of the reasons, one of the economic reasons that we have such a hard, large number of data is that the price of data storage is, has gone down significantly. So this is a plot on the x-axis is time in years. And on the y-axis is the cost per gigabyte of, US, of uh, hard disk storage. As you can see, and the y-axis is logarithmic. So as you can see, the price has come down significantly. And in 2015, uh, this, where this chart ends, it's about less than uh, 10 cents per gigabyte. So, and it has gone down even, even further in the, in the next, uh, in the years from 2015 to 2021. So because of this reduction in cost, we have an ever increasing ability 
to store data economically. Okay. Similarly, the overall capacity in terms of gigabytes has increased again on the logarithmic scale. If you see this plot, on the x-axis is years, and on the y-axis is our capacity in gigabytes. And as you can see, this has resulted, we have seen orders of magnitude changes in a relatively short span of time. And this is pretty interesting because this again shows our ability to store data economically. Okay. This is as a demonstration. Uh, in 2005, we got these micro SD cards that will store about 128 megabytes on them. In 2014, we had the same sized card that was now store 128 gigabytes. And now we have the same sized cars that are able to store more than a terabyte of data on in the same physical space. Okay. Similarly, if we think about uh, internet prices, another thing that we have done as humans on this earth is that we have been able to connect machines and we have been able to transfer large amounts of data. We have data stores and then we are able to transfer those data. And if you look that a look at this, then the cost of internet uh, has gone down significantly. Again, on the x-axis is years, and on the y-axis is, is the cost or the inter internet transit price in mega megabits per second. So as we can see that the number of, uh, that the cost of internet has gone down significantly. Similarly, global internet usage has increased dramatically over the, over the past few years. In 2021, it has, it has uh, almost connected the whole world. And me talking to you over uh, a video that is probably hosted on a server somewhere else, and you're able to access it throughout the globe is uh, as a gentle reminder of that fact. Okay, similarly, we, can, we hold in our palms uh, more data than uh, we could ever, ever dream of, say, about two decades ago. Similarly, not only have we, so up till now, we, what we have covered is that we have an ability to store data outside of bodies and we are getting better and better at storing large amounts of data outside of our body, our biological body. And not only is, are we able to store that data, but that data store is also, those data stores are also interconnected to one another through the World Wide Web and the internet. So at the same time, we also have an increase in processing power. So over the last few years, this is a plot of uh, how the number of transistors on a certain size chip at a given price has, in, has changed over different years. And as you can see, uh, this is Moore's law. Uh, we have uh, significantly increased our processing ability. So we can process more data, we can transmit more data, more and more economically. And that is where uh, so this is the sort of old time data transfers or data calculations that we had, but now we have pre supercomputers and we use uh, GPUs for performing high end computations that allows us to do a whole lot more with the data that we have. Now, my question to you is everything's great. We have data that we store. We have a way of transferring it, a way of storing it and a way of processing it. So the bottleneck, what is the bottleneck? If you think about it, our human processing ability or intelligence is, is probably the most important limiting factor in determining how much data we can process. So if you think about it, if I give you a table or a worksheet and ask you to calculate the salaries of every individual in a big organization, let's say a university, it's going to be cumbersome. You would be able to do it if you are given all the right numbers, but it's going to take a large amount of time. And this is where computers are fast and, and those have really revolutionized the way we are, we are able to handle data and where we are uh, and the way we process data. Okay. So, but this is data analysis by humans is the bottleneck in this whole picture. So another question that you may ask yourself, if machines are getting better, have humans become better as well? And that is a question I would like you to explore on your own. And if you have any interesting answers or if it raises further questions, think about those, okay? And if you're able to automate what we can do, 
much like what we discussed in our previous lecture in which we were able to classify different painters, if you're able to automate that classification ability into machines, wouldn't that be great? And that is what has given rise to the birth of data science. Our ability to store data outside of bodies economically uh, and transmit it, analyze it, that has given rise to this new science called data science of which data mining as well as machine learning is a part. So if we are able to use the scientific methods for the development of processes, algorithms, and systems to analyze data for extraction of knowledge from structured or unstructured data, we call it data science. So it's a, it's a pretty broad term. It encompasses machine learning, it encompasses data mining, and a whole lot of other fields as well, including databases. So this is the culmination of different parts of uh, our journey from storing data only within ourselves, then on to uh, in our thoughts or in memories, then in the form of written words, in the form of books and newspapers, and then we have moved on significantly to storing data on silicon and also storing data in uh, DNA actually. Uh, DNA has a pretty high density to store data. So we, some people are trying to use that as a means of data store is something for you to explore. But the point is, with increased ability of storing data, with increased processing ability, and with an increase in the interconnectivity of different data uh, hosting uh, servers, we have created for ourselves a cocoon or a web of uh, that allows us to do this type of new science that is called data science. 